In this session, we're looking at case study analysis. And we're going to look at how case studies can utilize quantitative data, the processes of cross-case synthesis, the concept around generalizability of case studies, and a range of case study analysis tools that you can utilize to present the data that you have in a way that can make more understanding for yourself and also for your readers. Um, and we'll also briefly touch on two of the readings that we'll explore more in the tutorials. So in terms of case studies, or in terms of the analysis of case studies, there's many different ways we can undertake case study analysis. But there's no one um, fully established way. There's a variety of different approaches. Um, there are some computer-based tools that we can utilize to assist us with case study analysis. And the readings go through and explore one of those in some more detail. But in general, we gather data and then we have to utilize that data to analyze what has occurred in the cases that we have under investigation. So in the main, we still have to code the information. Um, coding, informa coding data allows us to then categorize it, to um, structure it, look for patterns, um, and conduct some analysis on the data sources that we've been able to collect. Um, even if it's purely textual data or even purely numerical data, we still at some point need to code that in a way that condenses it to better facilitate analysis. Because simply looking at raw data can be overwhelming, particularly if there's a lot of it. So that's why we tend to code things, to synthesize them, summarize them, make them manageable so that we can start seeing relationships and patterns and aspects of the data that we wouldn't necessarily be able to see in just looking at the raw data. So there are four main approaches to doing that. Um, pattern matching, which is looking at different patterns in the data. Um, building an explanation from the data, building a narrative um, or explanation building. Um, time series analysis, which is looking at things, how they've changed over time, and multiple case studies analysis, which we'll talk a bit about in a moment. So, <clears throat> being able to actually analyze the results of your case studies is a very important aspect of any research study. Um, the data will not just present findings to us as it sometimes can in more statistical techniques. We have to actually seek out meaning from the data. Um, so the first part of that is to think about why we've actually set up the case study in the first place. Um, was it to address the research questions that we've posed? Uh, if so, then we need to focus our analysis on those research questions. How have they been addressed? Have they been sh um, shown correct or incorrect? Or what data has come out that supports or refutes the question that we're trying to answer? Another ap approach may have been that we were <coughs> um, trying to derive a generalizable result, something that could be then applied across other circumstances, say in other schools or other classrooms. Um, and in this case, it's the analysis is going to be more on what we've learnt from the case studies, the examples, the, um, the intrinsic findings that we've, we've derived as a result of looking at those case studies and how that could then be applied in other circumstances. And that would be the focus of our analysis. 
And the third approach is if it was a purely discovery based case study, um, um, case study, then that would be then what we focus our analysis on, trying to actually uncover something new or interesting or innovative and explaining that and justifying that as a result from the data that we have collected. So we really have to start looking back at our motivation for the research when we come to do the analysis part. Um, and ideally, you will have done that from the very beginning. When you set out what you wanted to actually study, you then thought through the sort of question you were trying to um, accomplish, but then have thought through the analysis of that. Because it's only when you really think about it from the analysis perspective is that you're then sure that you're going to collect the right data that enables you to do the analysis. Now, invariably, beginning researchers um, don't do that. They come up with some great research questions and come up with some interesting methodologies and collect lots of data. And then they come to the analysis part and they start realizing, oh, I didn't collect data on that, but I really needed to do that in order to answer that question. And the analysis is not done as well as it can be done because the data wasn't collected. Um, but that's a matter of experience. Um, everyone goes through that process, so it's nothing that can be really purely circumvented. Um, but as much as possible, you need to be thinking from the analysis perspective, even at the very, very first stages of conducting any research. As you'll no doubt start finding in your own little case study um, you're doing for your assessment. Um, when it comes to doing the analysis, that's when it starts getting tricky because you've now needed to start thinking, okay, what does this data mean? Have I collected data that tells me what I need to explain, be it to the research question as an exploratory approach over time or across multiple case studies? Okay, so the, the readings here take you through some explanations of some examples, um, particularly around looking at pattern matching, which is one of the common approaches used in analyzing um, case study data, where we've collected lots of information about different aspects. Let's say it's on student um, test scores and their behavior, and the technologies they've got access to. And we start looking at all those elements and start seeing some patterns that students do well on their tests if they've got access to the technology and they've had a teacher using a particular pedagogy. Whereas if they had access to the technology, but it wasn't that particular pedagogy, they didn't do well. That then starts telling us some interesting things around the importance of pedagogy in a particular circumstance. But it could be something completely different. But that's where the patterns in the data start telling us things that we can then derive in terms of our case studies. Okay, so if you haven't gone in though without any pre-established ideas, um, you can still derive um, narratives from the data that's um, emerging. So this is what we call explanation building. Oops. So here, you, it's a much tougher journey, but you can start justifying um, explanations of what you have seen occur and provide some explanations as to why you think it's occurring. And then the research is essentially hinged on how convincing you are in justifying what you've seen and explaining it in terms of the data that you've collected. Now, the third approach is around time series. And this is where you look at changes over time, essentially. Um, but again, there'll still be patterns that emerge from that, where 
um, various things occurred in the first instance, then different things may have occurred in the second instance and so forth. And you need to start building a narrative or explanation as to why these different changes have occurred or not occurred. Okay, and that pretty much goes on to explore that in a bit more detail. <coughs> so sometimes you've still got quite a bit of quantitative data and case studies can make use of quantitative data very effectively. One of the important approaches to do that is to frame hypotheses. Um, so essentially you come into doing a case study and you come up with what you think is going to happen and you set that out as a hypothesis. Then you conduct your case study, collect your data and so forth, and then you compare what you derive from what you thought should have happened and then look at the similarities and differences between those two situations. And then you can apply some statistical processes to that. Um, so it's a little bit different to how we've done other case studies where we go in with research questions and just start exploring. Um, it is still possible to establish a pre-post um, quasi-experimental uh, use of case studies, a quantitative approach um, doesn't necessarily have to incorporate any numbers. Quantitative approaches don't have to be numerical. They tend to be, but they don't have to be. It's around the approach taken. And so if you set things up as a pre-post exploration, defining what the pre-situation is and what is expected to happen as a hypothesis, then collecting data and essentially testing that hypothesis and then exploring as to what aligned or did not align with what was expected. So I mentioned before around this idea of cross case study synthesis or multiple case studies. This is where we can take data from a, a number of different cases and then start looking at the similarities and differences between those cases. And again, we can start using some quantitative approaches to doing that. Um, essentially, you're saying that, okay, well, one would sort of uh, be expressed as a hypothesis, and then you're looking at others in terms of how they relate to that. So it's sort of, again, quasi-experimental. Um, but we can use some um, quantitative processes known as triangulation and um, other uh, semi-statistical methods to actually look at where these cases differ from one another, where they are similar, and build an understanding of um, the overall issue that we're exploring. Of course, it goes beyond just a single case. It's multiple cases now, so it's can't just call it looking at the case. Um, but it can give us much greater insight into the individual cases by having looked at several of them. Um, and it can even go to the extent of trying to create what are called a typology of cases where you categorize different types of cases. So you may be in a school and you're looking at all the different, say, um, different cliques of students. You've got your um, the sporty students, you've got the social students, you've got the, the nerdy students. Looking at all of those as different um, types and they represent different cases within the overall um, context of the school. But looking at um, sporty students as a case is different to looking at um, the more academically orientated students as a case, um, and then looking at all the similarities and differences and so forth. And so it's sort of setting up a multiple case study analysis, but there would be some elements of each of those types of students that would be similar or different and that's what you would be exploring in a multiple case study um, exploration. So poster teams, one advantage you see in conducting multiple case studies over single case studies. 
what would be the advantage um, thinking about your own case study of looking at a number of different cases so it's not just the same case it's there've got to be some differences um, as opposed to looking at a single case study remembering a single case study can still look at a number of different examples within that case so a single case may be looking at um, the students in um, science class and you may look at 20 different students that's still, still a single case um, being defined and bounded by the science class but a multiple case study may be looking at the science class and the geography class and the history class and seeing how they differ and have similarities and even if some of the students may be in that each of those different cases so you can have the, um, can be quite dynamic and complex but the case in that in this instance um, is being bounded by the class grouping of the subject um, and then exploring what's occurring around that okay so one of the key aspects of research and one of the aims of analysis in terms of of the data that we're collecting is to try to be try to generalize the findings that we have from the research. Um, and essentially, it's being able to apply the, the findings to other circumstances, where it's not just unique to the one instance that we've been exploring. Now, inherently, that's a little bit more difficult in case studies, because case studies, by their nature, are focused on specific cases. But there are still ways of generalizing case studies. Okay, so some of the some of the main criticisms of case studies have always been that they are very difficult to generalize. Um, but there are approaches to generalization as long as we can stretch our concept of generalization. Now, in a purely quantitative um, scientific experimental model generalization definition, no, case studies can't be generalized. But if we take a somewhat broader understanding of generalization in terms of being able to apply the findings to other circumstances, say to another school where we've explored the, a case of behavior management within a particular school, looking at all the different approaches that they've used to conduct behavior management. Now, from a purely scientific method approach, that's not generalizable. There's, the variables are too, too um, over the place and all the rest. It's just not been structured to be generalizable. But there would still be findings that a principal could take from looking at a case study of what's happened around behavior management in one school and looking at how they could be applied in their school. Now, not directly. They have to be interpreted around their understanding of the context and all the rest. But there are certainly aspects that can be generalized. So once we accept a broader definition of generalizability, then we can start seeing where case studies can be quite generalized, um, where the idea of a case study is to present a case and the findings from that case so that others can utilize those findings in other circumstances. Okay, so in terms of case study generalization, um, the, the text is just going through and explaining to you some various examples of how case studies have been used in the past and the most famous one was around the US Cuban Missile Crisis. And there and again, the case itself of um, what happened between the United States and Cuba uh, around putting missiles in um, Cuba and all the different tensions that were built up around that and how that was resolved diplomatically so that um, war was averted was very, very specific. Um, nothing like that has ever happened since. Probably never will happen exactly the same since ever again. But the processes of negotiation and of coming up with a shared understanding of the consequences 
and how to diffuse and resolve the situation was extremely valuable and has been used as the basis of diplomatic negotiations ever since. So a lot was learnt from looking at that case study. Um, it wasn't learnt about how to resolve things between Cuba and America and missiles being put onto an island and so forth. That wasn't the findings. The findings were that there needs to be open dialogue, there needs to be communication channels, um, there needs to be a commitment and a resolve to try to avert war and processes in place to enable that to occur. And that has been the touchstone of, that, of international um, deliberations around crises um, since then. And that wouldn't have come about unless we examined that case in great detail and understood what was happening and how we learnt various things from that process. And that's where we can also explore case study analysis. It's not going to necessarily be the obvious aspect of the case that we're looking at. You may be looking at in terms of the technology they're using and student learning. And that may be very specific to a particular technology and a particular cohort of students. But the fact that um, that combination may affect the school's interpretation of homework and how homework is then utilised within that school. That may be the, the finding from the case study. Now, it wasn't necessarily what was intended initially. It was going in and looking at the impact of technology on student learning in a particular very narrow defined case but it may have had much broader impact and the findings from that study may then be much um, very much generalizable in terms of um, student engagement with homework and the institution of homework within an organization and how it's set and applied and all the rest around that sort of concept so this is where analysis is quite tricky in case studies of course things can emerge that are quite unexpected. They don't necessarily just answer the research question. We're collecting lots of rich data as part of a case study and we can never be sure exactly where that's going to go. We can have a fairly good idea and we can frame things and, and explore things in a particular um, context and, and structure and, and bound things as we need to in order to examine what's happening. But most of the interesting aspects from case studies come from the ancillary elements that we didn't necessarily know. Um, one of the problems of doing the pre-post aspect of case studies is that if you go in already expecting an answer, you're pretty much going to find that answer. It's relatively rare that you're going to come up with something um, opposite to what or different to what you expected if you've got a really good or a reasonably good understanding of the context and the situation. So it doesn't necessarily negate case studies though, because it's the exploring of that can lead to better understanding of all the other complexities. And that's where um, qualitative research and case studies within that context allow us to explore things, whereas quantitative studies looking to answer specific questions will often not even have the possibility of finding um, the outcomes that quantitative, qualitative studies can show. Okay. So again, post into teams, um, an example where generalization um, can be achieved through case study investigations into a research question. Okay, now the last thing I want to show you and take you through is looking at um, a set of tools that can assist with case study analysis. Now there's quite a range of tools that are available. Um, in the readings that you've been provided, there are a couple of other tools and um, structured websites to take you through the whole case study process. But these are a set of um, specific analysis tools that you can get access to. So, 
have a look at some of these. Um, just taking you through uh, Oops, just taking you through the help page. Um, so if you follow the links and you click on the little help icons or question marks, you'll eventually get to this help page, which explains the tools in a little bit more detail. But just looking at a couple of them, uh, Bubble Lines is a tool that you can put in sec different sections of text and it will look at various occurrences of terms. A lot of um, of these tools rely upon textual analysis where you've got um, interview, um, interview results, uh, survey results, documents, and you want to actually put those sections of text into a um, website in this case or desktop tool and generate patterns so that you can then look at these patterns and perform what's called pattern analysis um, to try to see insights from looking at that text. So here we see a range of books um, by, I think it was Jane Austen, um, and the different terminologies uh, being mentioned in the different books. And so it can be used to um, explore um, different elements of those texts. You could see a similar thing being done with curriculum documents or student essays or student responses around a particular um, item of work that they were working on. But there's a whole range of different tools that can be used to visualize um, this text. Um, let me just show you a few of them. This is just the word cloud one, uh, which you're fairly familiar with now. Uh, correlations is a fairly powerful one. Um, this is where you can put in a range of text and then correlate it with particular terms. So here we're correlating with the term think and there's various other terms and it will essentially relate how, how close that term is in the text to these other terms. Um, so say if you were using the term uh, students or say learning, and it might be interesting to see how frequently the word student is associated with learning versus say the word teaching is associated with learning. Um, and just gives us an idea of the philosophical perspective that the text is potentially demonstrating um, based upon the correlation of different terms. Um, but there's a whole range of different um, tools that you can utilize. Um, this one uses a metaphor of a map and with locations. But I'll let you explore some of these. Some of them are interactive um, and that they build out as it progresses through the text. Um, what's some other ones? But using the help page, you'll be able to come in and find out a little bit more about how to utilize the tool and use it for analysis. And then we just have our more traditional trends. So we can look at how throughout a text, different um, terms are being used uh, more or less and so forth. And these, of course, also provide you with opportunities to incorporate um, such tools in your own analysis processes. So lots of them, you really do need to read into them and look at how they can be contextualized to your own particular circumstances. Um, but they are certainly available for you to utilize.
Okay. So have a look at some of the different um, terms and you can explore their use. Um, and I'll let you go through and examine those in your own time. So that brings us to the conclusion of the content aspect of the course. During the tutorial, we'll go through and look at these tools and the readings in more detail and explore some of the other aspects that we haven't um, examined to date. And then the final session, um, there won't be a recording because that will be um, your presentations of your um, case studies. I look forward to seeing you in the tutorials.